Hi, this is Cameron Bowen, voice of Toy Man, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Ariel Horn, D, 5, 0. Initiate, part 2. To pull us back from the edge of losing ourselves, because <laughs> uh, this is am- <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, to get back to the topic at hand, because we're so good at staying on this on these tracks. Uh, right. Do you have any theories about uh, the various Robins that we saw this past season about Jason Todd, who we saw in that particular flashbacks ghosts on a on a ship uh, scene and the implied existence of Damian Wayne? Because what other baby would Talia al Ghul be holding on a secret island? <laughs> I don't know. Peter Kristoff. I don't know. <laughs> Who? Do you know exactly. about a secret DC Comics baby I've never heard of? No, I'm just saying whoever. I mean, it could be a totally random baby that she just totally. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, we got that big tease and rescue off. Too sure on how Damien will come to play. I'll let the comic lore heavy people who know more about it than I do take a gander at that one. But Jason is a very interesting character, especially because uh, Arsenal is back on the official team. And it's going to be really interesting. Audio play. Yeah. After the Young Justice audio play, Artemis let him back on the team. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how he fares there because we didn't really get to see a lot of him in season three. Um, So he seems pretty well adjusted from what we saw. But I'd like to see if that holds up in these high pressure situations. And if he doesn't, I'm just saying I would definitely love to see Young Justice's interpretation of Red Hood and the Outlaws. Because Jason is right there and Arsenal is right there. Maybe we'll throw in Starfire into the mix this season. It's been season four. I think we can introduce Starfire and Raven and whatnot. We got almost all the Teen Titans in there. But yeah, as to how he comes again, this is going off. Oh, he's another one of the phantoms that Dick has uh, Jason left behind. We'll see how he uncovers. I am very excited to see how Dick will discover that Jason is alive. And the drama that comes out of that. It's so good. We're just here for the drama. Yes. I'm like, I don't I don't know as much about superhero lore as some people, but I'm absolutely here for the drama. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That's what makes it so delicious. Speaking of superhero lore, but attempting to approach from a storytelling perspective, do you have thoughts on the legions of superhero, uh, the legion of superheroes ring uh, that we saw at the very end of season three that made my co-host Rich? scream the first time he saw it and almost knock over a table he's told this story many times yeah rich and eric have that in common they eric is very eric who runs young justice tv he's very excited about the legion of superheroes um all i can say is that one meme of honey you got a big storm coming because (laughs) the legion of superheroes has made it into the current earth 16 timeline oh boy, is there trouble ahead that they had to come back <laughs> and say it? I don't even want to guess what kind of trouble. The only thoughts that I have on my mind about that is going all the way back into season two, where if you remember, like we've traveled to the future a couple of times. And even though Bart saved Neutron, Earth was still destroyed. There was still nuclear attack. I mean, granted, that could have been related to Jaime, and now that Jaime is fixed and he's not going on mode as far as we know, knock on wood anytime soon, Earth could still be in shambles. We don't know that. We haven't seen any evidence to the contrary that things are all fine and handy dandy and fixed. So yep. the Legion of Superheroes is here to warn everyone of a big thing that is coming and they will get everyone all together. Maybe this is what the Phantoms team will be about. Maybe the Phantoms team is the core six and they are going to single handedly address this main concern that the Legion of Superheroes is kind of here to warn about. Oh, yes. These are all things. 
I regularly forget that season two has that brief flash of we fixed the future and the future is still a mess that is never addressed again. I always forget that that never gets addressed again because my brain just kind of fills it in and goes, yeah, the future's fine because the future's fine. But it doesn't. It ne- the- So you're right. That could I would love to see the Legion of Superheroes tie into that season two arc uh, that we had about about um, impulse. The future impulse comes from. Uh, Because that would be very interesting. Right? Absolutely. I mean, also, I've seen a lot of theories float around about Wally being part of the Legion of Superheroes. Like, maybe when he ceased, he ended up in some, in the future, somehow. The Speed Force doesn't exist, but somehow he has made it into the future. (laughs) And he is a part of the Legion of Superheroes. And they come back to return him. They literally drop him off at Artemis' doorstep. Like, I think you left something. (laughs) <laughs> like here you go so I found return to artemis <laughs> exactly. he's just got the t-shirt <laughs> yeah i don't know it's gonna be really interesting to see because i am not very familiar if at all with the legion of superheroes so i'm excited to see how they will tie in to season four yes, as am i i am not familiar uh i am not familiar almost at all with them beyond uh rich being extremely excited about them always <laughs> To the point that there was a while back, I was I had rewatched something from when we did the Young Justice Enhanced episodes, and there is a clip from that long before season three had come out, where Rich is just like, every time I see them on Rimbor, I just think about how much I want the Legion of Superheroes in this show, uh, and I had just sent him that clip one day and been like, <laughs> look, you're get you're getting your wish, <laughs> three <laughs> plus years after we filmed this, you're getting your wish. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I think that I will throw out the thing that Rich has brought up a couple of times that I do think would be interesting from what little I know about the Legion of Superheroes is that in the comics, they come back to find like young Superman and be like, you inspire Mm. teen heroes in the future, all of that. And the adapting that for Young Justice, uh, Rich's theory, uh, one of his many theories is that they're coming back to find Connor being like, hi, (laughs) other other super boy, Superman, super human you inspire teen superheroes in the future you should come with us (laughs) yeah when i was doing research on the legion of superheroes i saw that there was this one plot line in like the comic book where they put both like superman and superboy through like this like rigged trial to try and prove like that they wanted to see like the test of his power or something and i'm just saying that could be really hilarious to see them messing around with superboy for like (laughs) half an episode Connor is just like, I can't fly. I can't shoot lasers. We've addressed all of this before. I, I'm i not insecure about it anymore. I've gotten therapy. I've moved on. But also, no, I can't. I can't. Ju- I can't fly over a building. Stop asking me to. <laughs> I can get angry, but I know how to control it now. And that, my friends, is the biggest power of all. I've had three seasons of character development. <laughs> so a couple of other things that I knew you wanted to talk about. Uh you had some thoughts on the on the nuclear option that is brought up in Home Fires, I believe it is. Uh, yeah. And what implications that has uh, from a narrative perspective on this show? Look, you don't... This is Chekhov's gun. You don't just drop nu- the nuclear option in there and expect us to forget it. Like, it exists. There exists a plan to wipe the world of all these little itty bitty superhero children. And that's insane. So like, it's there, sitting there in the background. Is this going to be addressed in season four? Because I'm scared. And the <laughs> and at the very least, the inclusion of Leon and Amistad in the audio play leads me to think, and especially at the end in the diner scene as well, which leads me to believe that everyone who is like in the audio play will have a bigger slash core role this season. And as much as I would love to see these little toddlers run around and cause them up, it's just going to be there in the back of my head that, oh no, <laughs> this option exists to kill y'all. <laughs> so please don't go away. I can definitely see something go wrong maybe the nuclear option is what the legion of superheroes is there to warn them against probably not but you know 
It's insane. I do not want to see any of these little children harm. I'm okay if they're like kidnapped or something and all like the everyone has to band together to like rescue them because that's awesome. Maybe Will can drag along his wife to like, hey, our daughter's in trouble. Can we like go get her? <laughs> Please. I'd also love to see these kids like being super sassy and being like, I don't know, Amistad having his own abilities, he can kick butt, and Leon can shoot some plastic arrows, and he can probably hold their own for, like, a solid 30 seconds on pure shock value. Like, nobody expects these, like, four-year-olds to, like, do any harm. So, you know, but they come prepared. a child raised by uh, a superhero and an assassin doesn't know how to defend herself? (laughs) Exactly. I know, she could, she, I would say she could hold herself for, like, a solid 30 seconds to one minute against yes. any of these uh, bad guys. But I'd yeah, take, this... I'd take those odds. Yep. Yeah, no, this is going to be sitting in the back of my head for, like, the entire season every time I see a cute child on screen for season four. So thanks for that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think, even if it doesn't come up, uh, even if it doesn't, like, act- actually happen, because I don't want it to happen. I don't want anybody hurt. No. I think... Just the fact that it was introduced was for exactly the reaction that you're talking about of having that threat in the viewer's mind for the rest of the show. Because the show gives a really good reason as to why no one has actually done it, because they point out that every supervillain who was privy to this idea has been like, we know we can do this. We also know that if we do this, Superman will kill us. Uh, yeah. And so it's just kind of that that stalemate Cold War kind of situation where both sides are like, you don't do this specific thing and we won't do this specific thing. And everybody kind of agrees to not go there. Yeah. But the fact that it is still there as an idea puts everyone in the audience on edge always (laughs) about exactly the concept you're talking about and how that works as just that that thematic uh, tension for these characters is will be interesting to see how it plays out but yes i agree with you i do not i do not want to see these small children harmed they are (laughs) very cute and very strong and i want i want younger justice to continue being a thing yeah i mean who knows maybe they're all like okay and like the legion of you know the legion of superheroes will come back and be like oh hey i know you from the future like you're you are in the textbooks you're totally you're fine you're okay but uh no it's just the, the presence of leon from like the moment she has been introduced and i'm not alone in this it just makes me nervous because yes. of her unfortunate comic history and i'm like this is one thing i really don't want to see adapted from the comics just just let let, let that particular character be fine and okay and happy that's all i ask for i hear you But I also feel like Young Justice has done a very good job of finding ways to avoid certain things from the comics that might be part of comic history that don't people that we just don't kind of vibe with anymore, for lack of a better term. Like uh, Greg has talked about how he never understood, never kind of agreed with or understood why Nightwing and Batman had to like get into a huge fight for Robin to become Nightwing and how. In this interpretation of Young Justice, that didn't happen. Robin, Dick Grayson, just kind of grew up and was like, I don't want to be Robin anymore. I'd like to go be my own hero. And Batman was like, that's totally fine and reasonable. Please go live your life, uh, my son. Uh, and that how, makes sense. Like, that, that kind of thing. Or how like Barbara in season three is Oracle and is in a wheelchair, but we do not have to sit through and watch the killing joke and have not been given all of the details behind why Barbara is Oracle now. We just know Barbara is Oracle. And that part of her story, the being Oracle part, is the important, interesting part that we want to see rather than a storyline that has is not been great uh, in <laughs> many interpretations. So, but yeah, no. I meant fingers and toes and everything possible crossed for Leon because I want that precious, that precious baby to be fine. And grow up to punch people in the face and also shoot arrows. Amen. I want, I want a little middle school Leon who is a superhero now and whose dad is just chasing her around like, oh God, what have we created? (laughs) I mean, hey, if there was ever a possibility for an Arrow Fam spinoff, there you go. 
You got <laughs> bow hunter security on one end. You have whatever green arrow and black arrow you're up to. Jim and <laughs> Arsenal, Artemis. I mean, Sissy's there. Let's give the Arrow fam some screen time in a very hilarious <laughs> spinoff. I That's would all I watch want. this so hard. I would watch <laughs> every episode of that. I would buy every comic of that. That is so, that Heck would yeah. be so fun. <laughs> oh god that corner of the dc universe in this show is wonderful it is other things to cover real quick you had thoughts on the suicide squad that's introduced this season yeah they i i have a feeling they are going to be a bigger plot point this season especially because they were introduced in the audio play uh, amanda waller is g- gathering more and more supervillains. brick is with her now i don't remember exactly who else but i remember that one because he had avoided it in triptych and then suddenly he's with her now so she is gaining and i am very curious to see what happens with this aforementioned suicide squad that we need i don't think they're ever like formally referred to except when calder brings it up but i'm just gonna call them that for the sake of convenience uh yeah i think they're referred to as a suicide squad a suicide, not there we go. the suicide squad right uh <laughs> and that's what they are but yeah. yeah, this is kind of, I wonder what's going on. Because I've always been intrigued by Triptych, especially the behaviors of Sportsmaster and Cheshire in that episode. It was very interesting because even Sportsmaster shows up for like, you know, only that episode. And they're working for this villain. And it makes me think that either they will be inscripted into the Suicide Squad or they have already been inscripted into Amanda Waller's like organization because it's not like that. I mean, you have, you have these two villains who in season two were kind of like ousted by the light and the shadows for various reasons, you know, Sportsmaster because he directly like <laughs> attacked Black Manta and then they both snuck aboard his ship and tried to kill him and his son. But Two villains who have been like ousted and on bad terms. I don't think you can yeah. be accepted back into the shadows that easily or without strings. So it makes me think that they're not necessarily working for them and they're working for someone else, possibly not of their own control or will, which just ties into Amanda Waller Scott again. So maybe she will have inscripted both of them. Maybe they are already working for her. But the fact that she is gathering more and more villains is concerning. And I think that they are going to play a big role in season four, I say, as I put on my clown makeup (laughs) and ready to be proven wrong. (laughs) So, oh, God, this has so many thoughts in my head now, but I'm going to save them for one of our later points because I had not even thought about the idea of Cheshire being uh, part of Amanda Waller's Suicide Squad. And now it's in my brain. And now I have (laughs) many things to say, but I'm going to hold off on them until we get to talking about Jade in a minute because we have some Jade thoughts. Yes. But the final big theory before we move into screaming about Jade for for a bit uh, is <laughs> where I know you I know you and I when the audio play first came out had a converse, had a I think it was like an all caps back and forth conversation for a little <laughs> bit about where McGann and Connor at the end of the audio play uh, where did they go and what are they doing so what are some of your theories because I know I have I have mine. <laughs> Yeah, it's very uh, sudden that they're having this very secret going away party for the secret mission that is never expressly stated in the audio play. So it's clearly something that's going to be important and will tie into season four. I had the theory that they were going off to Mars to try and cure racism between the <laughs> red and the white. You know, between the red and the white Martians, you know, I say that jokingly, but no, it is something that needs to be addressed, especially because you have the whole thing with Macomb in season three, where they bring it up and, you know, he's working for the bad guys as a direct result of this conflict between the, you know, Martian races. So I think that they might go and I, not mistaken, are they taking Garfield with them? I don't remember that. It's never I I oh god I haven't listened to the audio play in a million years because because right? it was it was a live thing not a live thing but it was that one weekend thing and I listened right. to it like three times that weekend and took a bunch of notes and I haven't listened to it since yeah I don't know why it's in my head it's in, maybe this could be completely wrong I have it in my head that they took Garfield because it's either in your head that they took Garfield because they did 
or because they explicitly didn't and we all are like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> In that way that fans do. <laughs> We're like, right. Someone was left out of this group and now I have questions. Right. So, yeah, for the sake of this, I'm going to assume they are just because it's in my head and I will be corrected if I'm wrong later. But they're going some on this secret mission up there. So it's clearly something important. I don't know what it is. It could be as something as simple as they're having a private intergalactic wedding. And that's why Garfield's going with them because he's family and he's just going on a, you know, space honeymoon. But uh, and Superman can just fly to Mars. He'll be there. Yeah. He'll, be fine. He'll get there. There you go. He'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> he can it's fine it's like what like an hour <laughs> journey for him in first class so <laughs> he's good um but no they are they're definitely up to something a little serious there and aside from going to mars i do not have a clue but i'd love to hear what you think about this i think i i can't remember i don't think it was i think it was that i was texting rich and neil the day that came out my first thought was of course that it is wedding but i'm also like but I want every I want to see the wedding and I want everyone to be there. And <laughs> I'm I'm me and I'm trash and I want one thing from this show and it's for these two to be happy and in love. But I think all of the going to Mars ones make sense. Uh, my only other outside of they're going on a secret mission, they're going to have a secret wedding, they're going to end racism on Mars. Aside from all of those theories that all make sense in theory world, I believe I at some point texted Rich and Neil in all caps with no context uh, for what I was talking about. What if she's pregnant with no context? Um, we had been talking about uh, the audio play earlier and then there was a lull in conversation for a couple of hours. And then I believe I sent that in all caps uh, with nothing else and then followed it with like, I'm probably just making up nonsense here but what if uh i mean that would be something incredible that's also on my list of wild theories i of all of the wild theories that one's at like the bottom of my list for likelihood but if it turns out to be true i will have called it in all capital letters screaming at people via text um, <laughs> I really hope I will follow up and I will say if there's one thing I would really love to see in season four, even if it's like interrupted with some kind of tragic drama, I really want to see this uh, wedding go down. I agree. I would. I want to see this wedding. I would settle for flashbacks. I would settle for a tie-in comic. Uh, I would settle for uh, it getting interrupted by supervillains. Uh, I would. I would take many things. I just want to. I want. I want to see McGann in a wedding dress. I want to see the ceremony. I want it. I want it. I want it so bad. We didn't get a superhero prom. Uh, I want this one. I want. I want superhero <laughs> wedding. Amen. <laughs> I, I. I am a simple girl. I am a simple girl with simple wants. There we go. But speaking of married super couples and children and other various topics because as we, i have mentioned i'm so good at segues uh the other thing i know i have to bring up because it is very much your jam is red arrow and cheshire so let's take a little time uh and talk about that season three scene that wrecked both of us completely i am of course for those who may not be aware uh referring to the scene in exceptional human beings where jade stops by the Harper when Croc household uh, to look in on everybody and she and Will have a heartbreaking conversation about why she left and why she can't come back and all that. So now it's time for us to go into well-spoken analytical shipper mode and just fangirl about this amazing scene for a little bit. So what's your personal favorite thing about this scene? <laughs> oh, God. The floor is yours to scream at Will. <laughs> I think in my personal opinion, like putting aside complete shipping tendencies it is one of the best written scenes in young justice and it packs such a huge emotional like gut punch there like you have you know we started in episode four with the conversation with zatanna and her father which was like ouch and then you have this because it's been it was like a little lull for a while where we were focused on like the action and the comedy. And then you were like, oh, yeah, this show is great. And then all of a sudden it's like, Pam, this show is painful. We just wanted to remind you of that. <laughs> uh, so, like, you know, there's also something incredible about like their interactions because it packs so much information in just like, yes. I don't know, 
five minutes of screen time about them because Jade and Will don't have a lot of screen time. I like aside from, I don't know, Tim and Cassie, they're like one of the couples with like the least amount of screen time and like the most information that you get from them is, are like the Roy Harper journals in Young Justice Legacy because this that's is where you're. <laughs> Listeners, this is your periodic reminder to look up the uh, Red Arrow journals from Young Justice <laughs> Legacy because I talk about them far too much for this exact reason. <laughs> right. Because, you know, you have that huge time jump in between seasons one and two, where in season one, you have that like non consensual kiss and couple of like flirty sexual tension isk like scenes. But like otherwise, you know, you jump from that and all of a sudden in season two, they're married with like a baby, like a one year old baby. And, you know, it's like, how did that happen? It's like, oh, well, let us tell you, you have to go play Young Justice Legacy and unlock Roy's tragic backstory. <laughs> but um, yeah, but like, so like Cheshire gets kicked out of the league for this guy. Uh, not the, the yeah, the league, the League of yeah, Shadows. The league of Cheshire Shadows. gets kicked out of the League of Shadows for Red Arrow. And you don't know that unless you read the red arrow journals uh so please everyone <laughs> this is yeah. my periodic reminder read the red arrow journals it's so fascinating because i see a lot of like character analysis on jade that like leaves this out and she's such an interesting character just because of like that one detail because you like end season one and it's been made very clear to the audience that like jade looks out for herself like you know it's her motto every girl for herself you know, and she goes from this to starting this like relationship with Will and, you know, they start, you know, hanging out, well, quote unquote, hanging out together, being in the League of Shadows together. I assume there was some hanging out on the side. You know, they can't <laughs> always be doing some dastardly things. And that's how a relationship forms just a little bit. You know, I wrote out the timeline for it at some point. I wrote out like a based on context clues timeline for how this relationship happened. And mm -hmm. it's buried somewhere in some document somewhere but yeah it's like roy went to her first and was like i need your help with something and then accidentally kind of joined the league of shadows somewhere in the middle of that and ran with it for a while and then right. left and she left with him and it's a whole thing and then they got married and then they had a kid and right roy didn't know it's it's <laughs> wild it is wild because she like he slips up as you know he is bound to do and you know they catch him and they're like hey wait a minute <laughs> you're not actually uh, on our side and she like risks everything to save his butt and like that's not jade that's not cheshire she's finally like looking out for some aside from artemis who is family and is one of like the three people that she will ever look out for but you know this is like the first time where someone non-familial that she's looking out for and it clearly says so much about the relationship and then they start going and like hunting for speedy together and they form this and then they're together and they fight because clearly she wants him to give up on this whole thing and he's so obsessed and like for the good of the both of them and the good for their unborn daughter she leaves him and then you know she comes back in season two with surprise we have a kid and i'm going to help you get back on your feet which is sort of implied but yeah and then they find speedy and by the end of season two uh, Greg has noted that they were trying to make it work and then fast forward to season three and she's gone. You know, Will is set up in this beautiful house with their daughter and Artemis, who is the aunt slash nanny figure. And where is Jade? And, you know, we had all kinds of theories when it first came out. We were like, is Jade still there? I don't know why I thought there would be some kind of like happy ending. I don't know why I deluded <laughs> myself into thinking, oh, yeah, she's totally living there and being, you know. I think it's because uh, for those five years or however long it was between seasons, we were living in that reality of that ask Greg question of, oh, they're just they're just making it work. And that right? being our last our last word on on Roy and Jade uh, for the longest time that was season <laughs> three premiered. We're all like, they're just making things work. And then the show's like, N no, no. <laughs> thing. Jade did that thing that she does where she panics over family dynamics and childhood trauma and runs away from her problems. And I'm like, don't come at me with this with this characterization that's consistent. No, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's totally consistent. And that's what's, you know, unfortunate about it all for like, you know, for get, our shipper hearts. Get Jade therapy season four. <laughs> right. But going back to the scene 
it's and how much it just jam packs in there like just breaking it down from the beginning like the very like first moments yeah. you know will knows that she's outside and like she's lurking there which leads me to believe that maybe she's this isn't the first time she might have done it before he may not have caught her but she's definitely done it and this was like she wanted it to be the last time and so he goes outside and he sees her there and he knows she's there and even in the way that he talks to her he clearly knows her very well because on one hand he could just be like yo you need to come home or you need to make a decision and like be in or out of leon's life which is a perfectly reasonable thing to say because you know she's like a two slash three year old girl and she needs some stability in her life in her already crazy chaotic life but no the way that he talks to her it's very gentle it's very personal and friendly and he's giving her every opportunity to come home because he knows that if he packs too much she will immediately turn away and like run and he like is kind about it and he's offering and then she's trying to you know for like a hot second she even like lets herself like buy into it just by like the facial expressions and like he knows that her reasoning isn't all there this isn't like a hundred percent what she wants because it's obvious from everything that we've seen that she loves the both of them and she cares very deeply i don't know what is going on if it's anything more than just her trauma and her behavior and she ran away because you know panic you know that is a very valid interpretation and i think that's part of it part of me also thinks that it is something more like blackmail or something because at the end of that scene she runs away that that's that's something that has stayed with me from that scene which is very anti cheshire of her to do because cheshire as a character she's always like five steps ahead she is very her movements are like very sly very cautious very like thought out and planned and like she never like really stumbles or, or is like makes any last minute obvious decisions this is all stuff that she has planned up to her quips like well in advance <laughs> this is who she is and then you have like this confrontation which clearly she was not expecting and like at the end of the conversation she runs away which is so like not like her to do and it like it's very clear that she is and she also lets herself like cry <laughs> like she has yeah. to turn away to do it but like someone who is so good about keeping herself composed and like emotionless, she breaks down in tears and then she runs away, which this is clearly painful for her to do and makes me think that perhaps there are other forces at work here. As I think I remember when that first when that episode first came out and we discussed it uh, here on Well, Me and Rich talked about the idea of her being possibly worried of somebody watching or someone's tracking her or whatever she's been up to that we haven't been privy to. But it had not occurred to me until today uh, of the idea that she may be involved in the Suicide Squad specifically, that whole plot line, uh, which just makes me wor more worried for uh, Assassin Mom and <laughs> everything she's been up to. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I think it is a valid theory. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we also have that scene in Triptych where she's obviously working for someone else, but she's also working on her own motivations because she frees Shade, even though, like, literally as, I don't remember who is speaking, but they're saying that, like, Cheshire isn't going to let Shade get away without, like, some ulterior motive, and then she sets him free. So. Yeah who knows what's at work there maybe she, it was because she doesn't want anyone else to be chipped slash tracked like he is and she like she like maybe she is and that is what's going on maybe there's something on her head from that time where she betrayed the league of shadows in the five-year time jump and they have finally caught up to her which is very valid there was probably no way that after all that time she would have been allowed to live a normal happy family life even if she really wanted to either it personally cut up to her and she realized it and she was like i gotta get out of here now before i end up hurting anyone or someone had held it over her head and she was like 
okay, I'm just going to make a clean break for it. I'm going to leave and they are going to be better off without me. And that's what I'm going to tell myself to make it work. We just have to have a family field trip to go stop the entire League of Shadows. It's simple. We just get the entire Arrow family together. Uh, Will calls a family meeting and is like, hey, <laughs> my ex-wife is being hunted by assassins. Not ex-wife. What did I just say? Wife. Not- <laughs> I mean, we never know. Wow. My <laughs> slip of the tongue that hurt my heart. Uh <laughs> Like, hey, my wa- my wife's gonna come back, but only if we can stop the entire League of Assassins, the entire League of Shadows. But yeah, uh, I agree. I love everything about this scene. I rewatched it before we started recording tonight, and I was surprised to realize that it is only two minutes long. It's is a it? two okay. minute long scene. It's a very short scene. Uh, like because it because. Fe- you and I and me and Rich have talked about the scene so much because of who you and I are as people. Uh, yeah. But it's such a short scene. But I agree with you that it shows us so much of this relationship through storytelling and does so much with so little time, even down to like the fact that Roy catches her even in the beginning, Will catches her even in the beginning. That tells us whether you see it as she's done this a million times or however you like to headcanon this whole situation, it shows us that they're in sync, that Will can find her, uh, that Cheshire, who is an assassin and the sneakiest person on this show, and Will sees her in five seconds flat in the dark outside his house. Uh, and I'm just like, that that's true love right there. <laughs> I just love how in sync they are. Because even in, um, in, in Invasion, they were completely in sync during like bloodlines when they were fighting all the like it's the so millions good. of goons. It's so good. I, I wish I wish there had been an outlet to like see all of their adventures and how it came to be and how they came to work together. And I wish we could see them fighting more alongside each other because I feel I like want they were a tie-in comic adaptation of the Red Arrow journals. That's agreed. All I, um, I would buy every copy. <laughs> yes. I, me and Ariel will single-handedly fund this <laughs> I will we go will. to my local comic book store and be like, hi, I'm adding this to my pull list, but I'm adding it to my pull list 12 times. <laughs> uh, get me 12 copies of every issue. There we go. But yeah, I agree. Everything about that scene is so well put together, even down to and talking about just the way that he talks to her in that scene and the thing that I know I f- freaked out and screamed about and cried about of the thing where... Roy tilts her head up to make her look at him for something. Which, yes, the, <laughs> that that reaction, that facial reaction that our listeners can't see, <sighs> is is my heart exploding because it's so good and it's such a good shorthand for that kind of thing of just him being like, "You have to look me in the eye if you're going to say what you're about to say, and I need you to look at me." for this conversation to work and him not letting her hide and it just being that really gentle, quiet moment with the two of them. Uh, And it wrecks my heart and I love it. (laughs) Watch Young Justice if you like pain, (laughs) according to Ariel's friend. (laughs) I mean, where is the lie? (laughs) There is so much. But um, that scene, everything about it from the music to like the animation, the dialogue, the actions that the characters do. It is so freaking in character for the both of them. And like, that's that's what makes it so beautiful. It is in character and it is devastating because you so long thought that they were like trying to work this out. And it's clear that they've tried. I don't know for how long they've tried, but like something happened and it is just a tragic situation all around. And Will wants to fix it. It's yeah. clear that Jade isn't just doing this because, like, nah, I just decided I don't like you guys anymore and I'm going to go back to my supervillain ways. That's not it. She loves them and she wants to be with them, too. But it's kind of an impossible situation and the full ramifications of hopefully, knock on wood, we will get in season four. <laughs> yes. So speaking of, what what do you want to see between these two next season? More specifically than just happy endings of <laughs> murder mom and Archer dad get to just go be happy and raise this chaos child. Anything more specific than that? Because I know that's <laughs> what we both want, but. <laughs> I know. I personally, I've said this for a long time. I would really like to see 
Cheshire go through a redemption arc of some sort. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be huge. I think her character in Young Justice is really special, especially when compared to her comic counterparts. Like, they really made their own interpretation of her. And I think her version in Young Justice is very easily seen. She could have a redemption arc. It is feasible. It is logical for her to make different choices. And if there is some greater things that play, if she's freed from that, then maybe they could try again and make things work. Maybe it's as simple as she's freed from that and she ends up going to prison and she has to serve a sentence out and Will and Leon and Artemis come and visit her in prison from time to time and she has some family bonding moments with them as she, you know, does penance for her crimes as Cheshire. But I would personally love to see her as an anti-hero for a while. You know, she's just she's just yeah. Cheshire. She's not good. She's not bad. She's just meddling around where she sees fit. Maybe she could join the Birds of Prey if Young Justice ever did the Birds of Prey because I do know in the comics she was on that team for a little while. I just want to see her character have some kind of closure to this potential arc that they set up because it was really hard <laughs> for me especially in season three to have her show up for like two episodes and then one mention in the Thanksgiving episode where I got that family portrait that lives in my mind rent free uh, and, <laughs> and then you know <laughs> Will hooks up with yep. Artemis which I never want to talk I, about <laughs> a subplot we do not discuss <laughs> nope <laughs> but um a I, the, <laughs> the weirdest combo rebound uh, in all of comics yep um, I hope it stays a rebound and that this thing just kind of, and it'll make him come to his senses a bit and maybe he works towards getting his wife back. Oh, tying into my phantoms theory. They all go on a Save <laughs> Jane mission. It's fine. It's totally feasible. I am 100% but, um, here for the entire plot of season four being we're saving Cheshire. <laughs> we're saving <laughs> Young Justice season four. Save Get the cat. <laughs> Save the cat. <laughs> Get in, losers. We're saving Cheshire, and it's just the bio ship instead of the car. Uh, this episode, also known as Emily and Ariel, speak only in memes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, oh, God. Yes. I agree on all counts. I would love to see any and all of that. And I think it speaks volumes to how well Cheshire has been written as a character that uh, Cheshire could stop being a villain and just be part of this group. And I, part of me is like, I don't even need a redemption arc. I just believe that. <laughs> I, I don't even need to see it. I'm just like, <laughs> just, she, <laughs> Cheshire did nothing wrong on a sign somewhere. Cheshire did nothing <laughs> wrong. More, more screen time for Cheshire 2021. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yes, I know, I know, Cheshire's an assassin and a villain, and she's done crimes and caused international incidents, and yes, yes, I get it, but I just want her to be happy and raise a family in this weird little superhero world, where it's I will fine. Say she gets to be an anti-hero, and that's her court-mandated uh, community service. It would make me exponentially ha happy if this future panned out maybe not even in season four maybe season four leads up to this and in season five you know she and will are just raising their preteen you know with all the time skip she'll be a preteen by then their preteen hero daughter as she goes off on the team and that would be an amazing dynamic that i would love to see um but you know yes i would 100 percent love that i have i have said for, i think i've said for a long time on this show that i'm like <laughs> I just want to see this tiny child get weapons and get to be a superhero because after how many mentors she has clearly grown up around and how incredibly chill she was with briefly being teleported to space that one time, uh, I need to watch this child save the world uh, in the most chaotic way possible. She is. I feel like it's such an interesting dynamic that they've set up. Like eventually when we have young, young justice, um, younger she justice. <laughs> Younger Justice. <laughs> we amp up the secrets and the lies to a 10. <laughs> but, make um, everybody 10% younger and 10% more secrets. <laughs> um, somehow. <laughs> somehow. <laughs> God. 
God. <laughs> Can we also talk about the fact that Leon knows that her mother is Cheshire? Because <laughs> this threw me for a loop when I saw it on the for the first time. With well, the first time that we saw it in um our screeners, it was a mistypo. It was uh now we gotta get treasure for daddy. And I was like, okay. And then me and Melissa were talking about it and we were like, wait a minute, is that supposed to be did she say treasure or Cheshire? And we're like, oh, I guess we'll know whenever like the episode actually comes out because the subtitles will have been fixed by then. And then it did. Yeah. And, and I was like, like wait a minute. Were a little weird on stuff for some of the right. some of those season three episodes. But yeah, but no, she knows that her mom is Cheshire and she knows that uh, her dad misses her mom. <laughs> She's a very cognizantly aware three-year-old. <laughs> However, whatever age Leon is supposed to be, whatever indeterminate age, I absolutely adore the concept of this tiny baby child who's like, yeah, my mom's just, my mom's an assassin. I just know this. I'm, I, I'm very well adjusted. <laughs> Leon's the most like weirdly well adjusted of the bunch. <laughs> right. She's like, I grew up in the strangest uh, family dynamic and I am okay with it. I will admit though, it is a put like an amazing possibility like in the future. And I can absolutely see Young Justice doing this. If Jade is actually just not even addressed in season four and like she's not even addressed for like another season and a half until Leon is of age to become a hero. And then she kind of has to deal with the fact that, wait a minute, like it's not cute anymore. I'm not three. My mom is like, you know, an assassin and I have to mentally deal with that. And, you know, she has Artemis as a mentor and she can help her through that stuff. But like, then you got the issues of like, you know, abandonment and like the fact that her mom left her and what is my mom doing and why is she a superhero? Because she's being raised in a family where that is not the social norm, unlike Artemis. So I can see that as a possibility. Do I want it? No, I <laughs> no, I would like Jane to be in at least two episodes in season four. And more than she was an outsider. But I can see it happening in the future. But it is the thing that Leon has been raised in this household of Cheshire, Will, and Artemis. Uh, and so Leon has been raised by three people who are some of the, <laughs> the most violent superheroes even in this world. Like, Cheshire has definitely killed somebody off screen. We're pretty, it, it's her oh, yeah. job. Uh, it's vaguely implied that Artemis may or may not have probably killed somebody at some point being raised by Sportsmaster. She says, my dad probably wants you to wants me to kill you way too casually and bereft, which implies this has happened before. And will, and will also part of the League of Shadows for an indeterminate amount of time. And we don't know what he did. <laughs> so this is me, of course, falling down a rabbit hole over here. No pun intended. Talking about Cheshire. But yeah, Leon has a weird group of superheroes teaching her how to be a superhero. <laughs> she Such also has lots of good babysitters who have probably not murdered anyone, but still. <laughs> It's such a good family dynamic. Man, I am so upset. I want some kind of spinoff or a comic book or just, I would have loved to see what the, what it looked like with the three of them attempting to raise Leon under one roof. Just like a flashback. Of like, how does breakfast even go in that household? Because that's incredible. I think I wrote a fan fiction about it a long time ago. Like, there were five chapters of what happened when Artemis moved in with the two of them because that is just a treasure trove of interactions right there. I wish we could have Good seen that. chaos family dynamic. Spin-off sitcom that is just the, <laughs> the Wen Harper Croc family. Uh, Bow Hunter security. Chaos. Always on point. <laughs> and so on that note, thank you so much for spending time with us here in the Watchtower. Where can people find you here on Earth Prime? You can find me on Twitter at Horn 10 I don't have a website right now. I am working on it. Maybe one day you'll see me on a TV or movie screen coming near you. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Yes. All around. I will look forward to that day because I'm sure it's going to happen someday. Amen. I believe. 
Thank you to everyone for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones, and it makes our job easier if you just tell us. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.